Welcome everyone. We're really glad to have you tonight. Um, do note we are live streaming, so you are welcome to have your video on, but we understand if you don't want it up because of that. Um, I'm Amy Antonucci. I am New Hampshire Peace Action, um, the chair of the board of New Hampshire Peace Action, and I'm really glad to welcome you tonight to our Peace and Justice Conversation Series online for November 6, 2023. For over 40 years, New Hampshire Peace Action has been educating, mobilizing, and organizing to build a more peaceful and just future for all. In the spirit of respect, we like to start with an acknowledgement that we are doing our work on Nidakina, the traditional ancestral homelands of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki people. We honor with gratitude the land, the waterways, and those people who have stored Nidakina throughout the generations. I also want to let you know tonight is being co-sponsored by the Palestine Education Network, also known as PEN, which is a project of New Hampshire Peace Action. It was founded in 2004 with the goal of promoting peace in the Middle East and educating people about Israel's occupation and colonization of Palestine. PEN has emphasized the critical role that the US government has played in supporting Israel with $3 billion a year in military aid. We, um, they also would love for more folks to get involved and they can reach out, you can reach out to Peace Action and we can connect you. Um, also put a link in the chat after I'm done. A quick reminder on Zoom etiquette. We love when you keep your video on, but please do keep muted, especially with this many people. It's really helpful and important for your audio to be muted and use the chat for asking questions. Um, there's, you know, there'll be a time later on when I'll be going through the chat and using those questions. And that is how we get the most in. Um, so it's really helpful if you do use that. Uh, I'm also going to quickly say that we know this topic can bring up a lot of strong feelings for people. And we just ask that you remain respectful and treat each other with dignity. Um, we want everyone to be engaged and heard, but we're making a commitment for this space to feel safe enough for people. Um, so please uh, respect that. Thank you. And we are so excited to welcome Phyllis Bennis tonight to discuss the continuing crisis in Palestine and Israel. We're really grateful that she's able to come speak with us. We didn't give her much advance notice. We just reached out to her and she said yes. And because of the immediate, intense, and, and in some ways complex nature of what's happening right now, Phyllis has agreed to stay a little bit longer than 8 p.m. Um, so that we can hopefully get to all the questions, or at least a lot of the questions. Um, Phyllis is a fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies in DC. In 2001, I believe, she helped found the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights and more recently spent six years on the board of Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, she works with many anti-war and Palestinian rights organizations. She writes and speaks widely across the US and around the world. And again, we're so grateful to have her here with us tonight. We're gonna hear from her and then move to the Q&A and discussion. And, um, you know, let's let me, I'm going to turn it over to her. Just join me in a visible welcome to Phyllis. Thank you all. Thank you to Peace Action for organizing this. And I join you in recognizing that I'm working tonight on land that once belonged to the Anacosta and Piscataway nations. And we honor their elders especially right now, as we look at what is happening to the indigenous people in Palestine. Uh, we've seen attacks on Gaza before. This is by far not the first, but there are some qualitative differences in what we're seeing right now. This escalation that we've seen over this last month that has led to 10,000 
people being killed that that are known. There's at least 2,000 more buried under the rubble, and that's increasing every day. Uh, about a third or more of the people killed have been children, and that has continued day after day. UNICEF estimates that one child is being killed under Israeli bombs every 10 minutes, 24 hours a day, every day. So what we're dealing with is something on a qualitatively horrific level when you have more children being killed in three weeks than in any one year of all the global conflicts put together since 2019. Any year, 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, this year, there have been more children killed in Gaza in these three weeks than any year, linking together all of the conflict areas around the world, from Ethiopia to Yemen to Congo to Ukraine, all of them. So that gives you a, a, a sense of just how intense this, this moment is and why the call for a ceasefire is so urgent and so much the centerpiece of what we all need to be doing. The question of humanitarian aid, of course, is crucial. And it's not enough because if little bits of aid get in, or even if a lot of aid gets in, but the bombing continues, people will continue to die. So the ceasefire remains the demand, the most important demand, a ceasefire right now. Um, and we know how difficult it is. You know, history, our understanding of history is very much shaped by when you start the clock. If we start the clock on October 7th, we see a horrific set of attacks carried out by Hamas from Gaza against Israelis, about a third of them military, two thirds civilians, including children, including elders, a horrific, brutal, violent attack. And it's also true that what the UN Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, said a few days ago about that attack, as he was condemning that attack and targeting it as a major violation of international law and human rights. And he said it also did not happen in a vacuum. And he was attacked viciously for that, despite the fact that if we don't acknowledge that, we have no chance of figuring out what it will take to prevent future attacks like that. And that has everything to do with the nature of the attack, that it, how horrific it was on the humanitarian level, of course, the violations of international law, international humanitarian law, which are the, the laws of war, uh, that also prohibit all attacks on civilians by any side. And recognizing that the conditions that gave rise to that level of, of violent response has everything to do with the decades of occupation, the decades under siege, the collective punishment, the failure of Israeli troops and planes and bombers to distinguish between civilian and combatant targets, something that is absolutely required uh, by international law. All of those things play a role in creating that kind of violent attack. And to say that is not to say it's okay or to say that it's justifiable. It is absolutely not. It is not justifiable. There's no but. It's not justifiable, period, full stop. And if we're serious about it, we have to figure out where it comes from and what it will take to stop it. In the bombings that began three days ago, I guess, in Jabalia refugee camp, the largest refugee camp in Gaza, although it's a small area, it had a population of 116,000 people. The, the claim was by Israel that it was a success because in the first bombing that included two giant 2,000 ton bombs, which are, they create just unfathomably big uh, craters, and they destroyed huge numbers of buildings, and they killed in the first round somewhere between 50 and 100 people. They still don't have exact figures because so many people were buried under the under the rubble. But in that in that context, the claim was made by the Israeli officials that it was a success because they got this guy. They got this one Hamas leader. 
And it may be true. I don't know. There's been no evidence one way or the other. It could be true. It could be a lie. It could be almost anything. But on one level, it really doesn't matter. Because whether they got that guy or not, this was a complete violation of international law that prohibits collective punishment, prohibits the non-distinction, the, the failure to distinguish between civilian and military targets, and the it violates the law of proportionality. So by any stretch of the imagination, this was a complete violation. It's also illegal for an occupying power to attack an occupied population. We don't hear very much of that. We hear the discussion as if the Palestinians in Gaza, 70% or so of whom are refugees two or three times over because they are mostly refugees from 1947, 48, from what is now Southern Israel, who were forced out of their homes and out of their villages and off their land, either at the point of a gun directly or by fear of what was going to happen if they stayed. And they left, in many cases, holding the keys to their houses because they thought they'd be coming back in two or three weeks. And now, 55 years later, 73 years later, for those from 1973, uh, 1948 and, and 1947, they've never been allowed to go home, not for 75 years. So it's, it's a scenario in which Israel is violating human rights throughout this process while the United States politely requests that they not kill quite so many people, that they do it a little nicely. You know, we, we might think about it as, you know, it, it's certainly true that the U.S. has been very aware, U.S. officials, the Biden administration, Biden himself, Secretary of State Blinken, members of Congress, have been very much aware of the massive protests that have been going on across the United States and around the world demanding a ceasefire. And they have changed their rhetoric somewhat. They've, they've sent Blinken back to the Middle East again to say to the Israelis, please do this a little more in keeping with international law. Please try not to kill so many people. Please let in a little bit of humanitarian aid. Maybe you could even have something, we'll call it a humanitarian pause, just for a few hours to let in some of the aid, maybe let out a few of the international passport holders, not ordinary Gazans, certainly, but you know, people with American passports or British passports or European passports, shouldn't they be allowed out? You know, it's a very polite conversation. And the other thing we know is that Netanyahu and his government have basically said, nope, not doing that. And then we've got to figure out now, why would that be? The United States is the single most important supporter of Israel, who provides not only uh, a, about $4 billion a year in military aid as a starting point, usually it ends up significantly more than that, but 3.8 is the official starting point, And there's always a couple of billion more sort of added on. But this year, they're also debating how to come up with $14 billion extra. Now, if you add that together, you get $18 billion. That's more than 75% of the entire Israeli military budget that we are paying, we taxpayers. So it makes us complicit in what the Israeli military is doing with that tax money. The US also for many, many years has protected Israel in the United Nations, has made sure its, its officials, whether military or political, are never held accountable in the UN, in International Court of Justice, in the International Criminal Court, or anywhere else. They provide absolute impunity they make sure that resolutions against Israel are never passed at the UN. So why would the Israelis be so hardline about this and say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to do what you ask? And you know, you can sort of imagine the conversation. The the US goes in and says, Would you please do this a little better and maybe allow a little bit of a pause? And the Israelis say, No. And they say, Okay, well, we tried, and they go home. Now imagine if they did it slightly differently. Blinken goes in or Biden goes in, whoever it is, General Austin, the, the uh, defense secretary, and says, OK, this has got to stop. You've got to stop the bombing. We need a ceasefire right now. And Netanyahu says, nope. And then the U.S. interlocutor comes back and says, oh, OK, I got it. And you know that the rest of that this year's $4 billion that we promised to send you? 
four billion dollars worth of weapons and cash, you can kiss that goodbye. And you know that 14 billion that we're still trying to arrange a way to, to let Congress authorize that for you? You're not getting that either. You can forget about that stash. And by the way, you know that about that protest that was held out in Oakland on our West Coast that prevented for a while a ship from leaving port with a load of weapons destined for Israel? Well, we decided to send our Navy to join those protesters and protect them and make sure that boat stays in, in the port. Our port, not your port. You're not getting those weapons. And by the way, we're reversing our position on the International Criminal Court. And we're telling the prosecutor to go ahead and move fast on moving forward on this investigation that he's supposed to be working on, but somehow has been stalled for a while. We don't know why. But now we're asking him to push forward, make it faster, investigating Israeli war crimes and those carried out by anybody else as well. This is an even-handed effort at accountability that have been carried out in the occupied Palestinian territory. And this is all just step one. You know, you could imagine that. I think that the Israeli response would be very, very different, <laughs> even before they got to step two, which involves implementing all those things that we talked about. And it sounds like somebody didn't have their, uh, their mute on. Can people please put on their mute? It's pretty distracting. So that's what we are dealing with. We hear in the wake of these horrific realities on the ground, we hear polite requests. Could you please do it a little less violently, etc.? That still is not going to work. Now, the press has been very good about a few things. They've been terrible about a lot of things. They've been pretty good about describing Biden's increasing criticism of the Israeli policies, but they have not been asking the critical question of why aren't there any consequences when Israel says no? This is a serious problem. And none of the mainstream press are asking that. So the, what we see that becomes much more important than any of these polite questions is the kind of bear hug diplomacy that we've seen from the president from the beginning of this crisis. So that no matter what he actually says, whether in public or in private, the message is go ahead, regardless of the casualties, we got your back. Because every time there's one of these polite requests, could you please do it a little bit more in keeping with international law? It's always prefaced with, we have Israel's back. Israel will never have to do this alone. We stand with Israel. Israel is our ally. We never abandon our allies. And instead, what we're hearing is that instead of actually trying to push for a real ceasefire, an end of this wanton killing that is devastating this whole population, they are sending now two aircraft carrier groups, which means a total of probably about 130 to 140 warplanes on those two ships, something like five to 7,000 sailors. Just today, we also learned, along with the extra special forces that have been sent, and a 1,000 more troops were just sent, bringing to about 45,000 US troops in the region, that as of today, they, the Pentagon just announced the arrival in the region, they're not saying exactly where, but in the area under the control of Central Command, whose main arena of operations is the Middle East, they have now sent a military, uh, sorry, a nuclear submarine that is nuclear weapons capable on the grounds that that's needed to tamp down the tension in the region. It's to reduce the tension. Can you imagine that there's that kind of illusion in this capital that sending a nuclear armed submarine, because they never confirm or deny whether it's armed with nuclear weapons at any given moment. So any Navy, any army, any military, any government anywhere in the world where one of these nuclear capable submarines is known to be has to operate on the assumption that it is armed with nuclear weapons. Because if you don't, it could be very, very dangerous. And that's the illusion of what is going to reduce the level of tension in the region. This is astonishing, this, this kind of 
this this kind of uh, illus illusory, illusory thinking, shall we say. So what we are looking at, in fact, is the threat of what a group of UN special rapporteurs uh, have now identified as a direct threat of genocide. And they use that term very deliberately, understanding precisely what is the definition of genocide in international law. It's not just some idea of mass killing that any mass killing you know, qualifies as genocide. That's not the case. Genocide has very specific definition and it basically has two components. The first is there has to be evidence of the specific intent by those who are carrying out a military attack, a specific intent to destroy in, in whole or in part, in any even small part of a group, a group that can be defined by race, religion, language, ethnicity, social structure. It can be almost any kind of identifiable group. We are at the moment having no problem seeing evidence of exactly genocidal intent from Israeli officials, from the minister of defense in Israel who called all of the Palestinians in Gaza human animals and said, we will treat them as such, to the latest, another US, uh, sorry, another Israeli official who yesterday said that they should be attacked with, an, that there should be a nuclear attack inadvertently, one assumes, confirming Israel's long denied nuclear weapons arsenal, which the world has long known about, but Israel doesn't acknowledge, nor does the US. So this was a pretty good indication that, oh yeah, we do have them. And I think they should be used against the Palestinians in Gaza. Another statement from another uh, um, official said that there are no civilians in Gaza. They are all combatants. And then there was the member of the Knesset who said a few days ago, I'm forgetting his name, a young guy, not from one of the extremist parties, the Jewish Power Party or one of the others that were so extreme in their racism that they were for many years excluded from the right to even run for office in Israel, who are now leading the, the government, not just in the Knesset. He was from the so-called mainstream, the center-right party of Netanyahu, the Likud party, and he said explicitly, we need another Nakba. And he even chanted it as if he was at a sporting event. Nakba, Nakba, he said. The word Nakba in Arabic means catastrophe. And it's the word that Palestinians use to describe what happened to them in 1947 and 48, when the 750,000 were expelled from their home and they lost their homes, their lands, their country. And here he is saying, we need another one of those to expel people all over again. Because what is at stake here is the goal of expelling Gaza from all of it, from its people. Okay, can people please put on your mute? Thank you. The goal of Israel for many years has been to create what did not exist at the time of the founding of the state, to create a land without a people that will be populated only by Jews. And this is the basis for the findings of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and B'Tselem and Yesh Din and other both Israeli and international and UN human rights agencies. The finding of <clears throat> Israeli apartheid is rooted in this notion that what Israel is trying to do is to ensure Jewish domination over the non-Jewish population, meaning the Palestinian population. And in that context, we see the direct specific intent to wipe out that group. So that's the first of the two requirements for defining what is genocide. The second requirement identifies five specific acts and said, if any one of these acts is being committed in the in the effort to implement this specific intent to destroy all or part of this group, it counts as genocide. And it turns out Israel is, com is already committing four of those five acts. The first is killing members of the group. 
The second is seriously injuring members of the group, either physical or mental injury. The third is creating the conditions where the group has no way to continue living, like denying access to all water, electricity, food, fuel, medical supplies, medical care, and destroying houses. That's a pretty good indication. The fourth is preventing children. And what we see now is killing children in huge numbers. I would say that probably counts. So we see direct evidence of the beginnings of a genocide here being played out in real time on our computer and, and phone screens around the world. What is, I suppose, optimistic in the midst of that is to recognize that unlike in earlier wars, the people in this country are not buying what they're being told. They're not buying the line of the administration that all of this is legitimate self-defense and we just want Israel to do it a little better, You know, not make some of the same mistakes we did, but what they're doing is okay. Bombing Gaza is somehow okay. It is not. And people in this country are recognizing that. So 66% of Americans in the poll just three or four days ago said they want an immediate ceasefire. They want the US to call for a ceasefire. 80% of Democrats said that. And Republicans even, 56%, 57% of independents. So overall, it's two thirds of the people in this country want an immediate ceasefire. They're not buying this propaganda that we're being fed. And this is a moment that comes after 20, 25 years of work of the Palestinian rights movement to change the discourse in this country, to change the narrative, to change how the public thinks about the issue and talks about the issue, to change the media coverage. And eventually, and this was just beginning, we've had huge popular changes, significant uh, media changes, and we were just starting to have some very serious political or policy changes over that time. That's where we were on October 6th, before that horrific attack, but in a period where Palestinians in Gaza had already been living for 16 years under siege, where everything they had access to was controlled by Israel. The two crossings that allowed goods to go in and out were controlled by Israel. The Egyptians controlled one gate where people could sometimes once in a while go out in very small numbers, but very few. Israel basically controlled Gaza for 16 years in this siege. We were told, well, they're not occupying Gaza anymore. The soldiers were pulled out and the, and the settlers were pulled out. That's true. And they changed from a, an occupation on the ground to a siege, which is still occupation under international law because occupation is not defined by how many soldiers are on the ground at any given moment. Occupation is defined by actual control, meaning that at any moment, the occupying power can reassert its physical presence and that in the meantime, it controls life within the occupied territory. That is clearly true of Gaza, where Gaza has no control of its own borders, its own enter, entry or exit from its territory, its own economy, its imports and exports, its territory, its water, its coastal waters, its airspace, its anything. It has no control of any of that. So it is still occupied territory. So in this context, where Gaza has been under siege, and before that it was occupied, uh, for so many years, the impact on the population has been excruciating, even before this current extreme version of a siege that doesn't allow anything in. Under the old siege, it was so severe. You know, it's, it's one of these weird things. I've been working on this issue a long time, and I've studied a lot of the reports from the UN and from humanitarian agencies and other agencies about what the siege of Gaza meant for people inside. I've been to Gaza, I travel in Gaza, saw the effects of the siege. And I thought I knew pretty much what it looked like, what the impact was on, on families. But then I saw something the other day in one of the studies 
uh, one of the UN agencies. And I was stunned. I was, I was shattered because it turns out that under the old siege, that was sort of the good siege, right? Where some food did get in, some water was able to be made clean enough to drink, even though the UN in 2012 and again in 2015 warned the world that Gaza would be unlivable. That was their word, unlivable by 2020. And 2020 came and went, and Gaza was long since unlivable, and yet there are still 2.3 million people living there and dying there. And what I read was that under that good siege, 20% of Gazan children are stunted by the age of two, because while there was some food, there was not enough, and there was not any good food. There wasn't protein. There, there was no access to fresh vegetables, to fruit, to enough milk, to all the things that children need to thrive. And the result was 20% of the population stunted by the age of two. That's a generational crisis. And the Gazan people and the Palestinian people as a whole and the people of the world are going to be dealing with that for generations to come. So that's what the conditions were that, that were in place before, before all of this happened. And while this shift in discourse had gone on in the US, so that for example, in the US Jewish community, in a poll taken just two years ago, 25% of Jews in this country said they believe Israel is an apartheid state. 38% of young Jews said the same thing. 44% of, of Democrats in 2021, I think it was, said they think Israel is like apartheid. They weren't quite saying it was an apartheid state. They said it was like apartheid. That's extraordinary. That, you know, for me, imagining that when I was growing up as a Jewish kid in California, there was nothing like that. We never learned about apartheid. We knew about South African apartheid. We didn't know about the Israeli version. You know, we didn't know about colonialism. We didn't know about any of these things. We knew that if you were Jewish, you supported Israel. That's the identity. That was our identity. We were proud of it. And as a result, we didn't learn very much. We didn't learn to think independently about it. So what is the movement facing now? You know, with the, the we're at a moment where unlike the past, where the, the movement for Palestinian rights, how should I say this? The movement has always worked on the effort to look long term, you know, changing the public discourse. It's a decades long challenge, right? And for the first moment, we are facing a crisis where we need a ceasefire yesterday. We need a ceasefire last week. And we definitely need a ceasefire today. We can't even think about tomorrow. And we have a movement that's powerful enough to actually have some impact, some real impact on actual policy today. We've seen that shift. We've seen the shift in language. You know, the first week here, we didn't hear Biden or Blinken or any of them talking about, could there be a little bit more implementation of international law? Could you do this a little bit less violently? Could you maybe allow in a little bit of humanitarian aid? All we were hearing was Israel has the right of self-defense and that's all you need to know. Israel was attacked on October 7th and that's all you need to know. This is Israel's 9-11 and it'll be just like our 9-11. We hope they don't necessarily make all the mistakes we did, but we understand their rage and they will go forward and that's okay. And now we're hearing something a little different, but it's not enough. So for a movement that's used to working long-term, all of a sudden we've got to work on now. The moment of crisis is now. And so that means we need to not only be working on what's happening in Congress, what's happening in the White House, we need to be thinking about local campaigns and state campaigns. Ceasefire cities should be a new campaign around the country to get uh, um, city council resolutions passed saying we need an immediate ceasefire. City councils can't order a ceasefire, obviously, but when we start to get 20, 30, and 100, and 300, and 500 cities around the country calling for a ceasefire, that plays a role because members of Congress know it's going to affect 
how their votes happen. The president's going to know that this is going to affect his election. So all of that stuff can begin to overcome the impact of this bear hug diplomacy that ends up undermining the very words we hear from the White House, where the takeaway message is understood much more as a uh, as a as an indicator of what the U.S. position really is, which is Israel's our friend; they can do whatever they want. So it remains most important that we think about this question of of, of a ceasefire. What's it going to take? How do we stop the U.S. from vetoing ceasefire resolutions at the UN? This is an old story. You know, we can trace this back in 2006 in the war in Lebanon. There was an international call for a ceasefire and Condoleezza Rice went to the UN Security Council and said, no, we don't need a ceasefire yet. And it was like, really, why? You, there's not enough dead people yet? You know, this is the claim the US is making now. We can't have a ceasefire. It will only benefit Hamas. And it's like, excuse me, did you forget that it might also benefit all those children who won't die? Won't it benefit them just a little bit? Not to speak of their parents and their grandparents? This is a shocking thing to hear that the only thing that matters in our consideration of a ceasefire is the impact on the military sides. We're not even thinking about the people who are doing the vast majority of the dying, how they might be helped by a ceasefire. So we've got to be fighting for a ceasefire. In 2008 and 9, when, when Israel went into Gaza for the first time in Operation Cast Lead, again, there was a, a call at the United Nations for an immediate ceasefire. And again, and again, it was Condoleezza Rice, the very end of her term, came back and said, nope, we don't need a ceasefire yet. It's one of these astonishing things. We saw it again in 2014. We saw it in 2021. But that time, we also saw, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. We also saw a different response because that time we saw a pushback. We saw pushback from Jewish members of the House, 12 of them wrote a letter. They were all Democrats. They were writing a letter now to their own president. This was to Biden saying, we desperately need a ceasefire. And yes, they started their letter by saying Israel has the right of self-defense, et cetera, et cetera. But their conclusion was there needs to be a ceasefire. 25 members of the, of the Senate did the same thing. Also all Democrats challenging their own president. And then my personal favorite, 500 former staff per people from the Biden-Harris campaign. These are the people who ran the state office, the city office, the campaign offices that put them in office, that got them elected. And these are people who have to get a job every two years in the Democratic Party with some different campaign. They wrote an amazing letter that was fantastic, not only because of what it said, because it put the, the need for a ceasefire in the context of what they called 73 years of Israeli oppression against Palestinians. They talked about colonialism. They talked about apartheid. But most of all, they said, we need a ceasefire. And what was so important about that letter, besides what it said in the text, was that it meant those people who have to get a new job every two years had come to the conclusion that criticizing Israel was not political suicide, that they were not going to lose their job or lose their ability to get another job. And they didn't. They were all back the next year. So that was a huge indicator of how this discourse shift was underway and why it means we can, we can, ha we can get to a ceasefire. We can use these shifts in the discourse to say, it's fine to talk about a humanitarian pause, but that's not enough. We need a ceasefire. And that's what we're fighting for. We're not going to wait. We're going to fight for that. And that's what we're going to, to have to do. Netanyahu just called for a holy war against Gaza, and he referenced it on the biblical story of the Jews being ordered to annihilate the entire population of the Amaleks. I'm not sure I'm, I'm pronouncing that right. It's Am Amal I think it's Amaleks. Because of the need for revenge, you know, the Bible has all kinds of stuff in it. You can find pretty much anything you want. So Netanyahu, pretty secular guy, but he got somebody who knew the Bible, found this story, and he came out and said, just like our ancestors were told to annihilate the Analects, 
we will annihilate our enemies now. Any more evidence needed that this is a genocidal intent to go after the entire population? That if we're going to go after one guy and we have to kill a hundred people in that one bomb, that's okay because we got the guy we wanted. That's okay. That's what we are dealing with. That's why you had hundreds of thousands of people all over the world this last Saturday, including tens of thousands in DC. I don't know how many were there. It was at least 50,000, maybe it was 100,000, I don't know it, but it was a lot of people, a lot of families, a lot of Palestinian families, but a ton of others. It was not only Palestinians, it was people with a heart, human beings saying, this is not okay. We can't allow this to go forward. So I wanna stop in a minute so that we have time for questions and, and discussions. But I wanted to just remind people of one thing, and that is that many of us, many of you, have been working on Palestinian rights for a really long time. And for a lot of us, that's been a long-term campaign. And we've tried to do a lot of good education to use the reports of the groups like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and Beth Selim and Yeshdin and all these other groups to talk about Israeli apartheid. That was a hard conversation that went on for several years before it became as normalized as it now is. But right now, the crucial point is to call for a ceasefire. We don't have time for the education somehow. We've got to do it. We absolutely have to do it. We need to do teach-ins. We need to do webinars. We need to do flyers. We need to do talking points. We need to do all that stuff. We need to be talking to members of Congress and members of the city councils and state assemblies and all these things. But most of all, it has to be focused on a ceasefire. That's the urgency. That's what people in Gaza, those who are still alive, those who get access for a minute to their cell phone or their computer, that's what they are telling us. That's what we need to focus on, is how to build support for a ceasefire. So let me stop there and open up for discussion and comments and questions, all of that. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Um, it's a lot to take in. And some um, questions have come in, in the chat. I'll start with those. And people, please feel free to, to keep putting them in there. Um, okay, so there was a question about how all previous Israeli assaults on Gaza have ended in a ceasefire when Israel's international enablers, US especially, insist on that. Yet inevitably a new assault will occur. Will it be different this time if we achieve a ceasefire? I don't know. I don't know. Israel has clearly made a decision that this time is different. In the past, they've said, we won't do a ceasefire until something. Now they're very clear, we don't want a ceasefire. We want to end the existence of Hamas, which means the existence of the people who make up this enormous organization that goes way beyond its military wing. Um, there is no way they can wipe out Hamas without massive killing and destruction across Gaza. And in that context, what it will take for them to say, now we've won, I don't know if it means killing everyone in Gaza, that's certainly one of their options. They are continuing to bomb in Southern Gaza where they have insisted that people from the North leave and go to the South, but the South is not safe. They are bombing it. They're bombing the transit road uh, to get to the South. And there is still, for the vast majority of people, no water, no fuel, no food. The hospitals have largely collapsed uh, and the ones that are functioning are functioning without almost any access to medicines. I know you all have heard the stories of children in surgery without anesthesia uh, being operated on, on the floor because it's more stable when the bombs hit nearby than an operating table. Uh, this is the 24 seven reality across Gaza. So what Israel is going to define as its victory, I don't know, and what they will 
allow later, but that will also depend on us. It will depend on what the world allows them to do, and it will depend on what we can prevent from our own government in terms of what our government has historically done, providing protection, providing the money, providing the weapons, providing the arms, providing the vetoes, all of those things. If we can stop our government from, from, from providing that, I think that the overall view from the rest of the world will be very clear. There, there was, as you know, when the UN finally got a vote in the General Assembly where there is no veto, the vote was 121 in favor, 14 opposed. Of the 14, of course, two were the US and Israel, five were among the tiniest populations in the world, small island states, several of which, like Micronesia, are bound by treaty to follow the US lead on foreign policy. So between Micronesia, Pal uh, Palau, not Palau, Nauru, uh, Tonga, and two others, I'm forgetting which of them this time. I don't blame them for it. It's They don't have much choice, but it's hard to take that seriously as, as indicating a significant component of the world's population. So. Thank you. Um... Okay, here are some, I, I wanna prioritize some, some questions here about strategy, essentially. Um, Abby is wondering what argument for a ceasefire might be most compelling to our Congress people um, in terms of their interests, seeing as moral reasons aren't seeming to get yeah. through. Yeah, I think, I think we can't stop with the moral reasons, whether they get through or not. For us as moral human beings, we have to keep using them. But that doesn't mean that's the only argument. The other, One of the other arguments for Democrats in particular is that they are losing votes massively. I don't know if you've seen all the polls, but the scary one for Democrats, because the presidential campaign plays a huge role in Democratic nominees for Congress. Because if people are staying home because they don't want to vote for the Democratic contender, they're not gonna come out just to vote for Congress. So that's a, a serious uh, challenge. The polls indicate that the, in the Arab American community, which is not a huge community in the United States, but in five of the swing states, it's a significant community that is big enough to swing it over the amount by which Biden won in 2020, right? So in a place like Michigan, Support for Biden has dropped from 56% to 17% among Arab Americans. I don't see that changing, even if the war ends before the election, unless Biden changes and takes some responsibility to actually call for a ceasefire and enforce it. Absent that, you know, one of the chants in the in DC at the protest on, on Saturday was will remember in November, will remember in November. The mainstream press, the progressive press has been filled with pledges, with articles, with analysis of what this means. And it's a very frightening reality. There is no question in my mind that Donald Trump, if he were president right now, would be endorsing genocide by word probably. I have no doubt that he would be worse than what the Biden administration is doing right now. But it's the Biden administration that is doing it. So the notion of expecting Af uh, Arab Americans, Muslims, others, people with humanity to say they will that they will vote for him, I think is going to be a new kind of challenge. I work for a nonprofit, we don't endorse or criticize candidates directly, but I'm looking at the, what the polls say and trying to sort out what that means. And I think that one thing it means is that it's going to mean a whole set of new challenges for Democrats, including Democrats who have nothing to do with foreign policy, uh, Democrats who run for Congress and are not on that committee, Democrats who are running for uh, for other things, for city council or state state office, governor, whatever. Will all, I, in all likelihood, as far as I can see, will be paying a price for this. They will pay a price for it. So that I think, when we talk about strategy, 
uh, for how to win a ceasefire, that's one of the arguments to make, is that if there isn't one, you people may all be sent home in the next election. Okay, interesting. That's that's useful. Those polls then are powerful for us to be bringing around with us. I know a few of us are going to congressional offices tomorrow, so maybe I'll do some print out, printouts. Um, Doug wondered about trying to call the Israeli embassies in Boston and D.C. He was not able to get through. Is that something that we should try to do? Is that is there a way to do it? Is that a place to put some pressure? In in my own view, it's not. Um, the urgency is so intensive that I don't, in my own view, I don't think that's a very good use of our time. I would spend the time calling members of Congress, call the White House over and over and over again. They count those calls. They count the emails. They count the letters. Yes, letters mean more than emails, but emails mean a lot. Do them all. You know, set up parties to do phone banking together. Everybody sits there on their cell phones with those various numbers to call your various members of Congress. But people should also be finding out, you can find out from their uh, from their local offices for Congress people, when are they in the district? Like, are they in office? Are they in Washington this week? I actually don't even know. I, it's easy to find online. There's a couple of different websites that have the congressional calendar that says which weeks they're in the office, which days, and which days they're in their districts. For the days they're in their districts, what is their public calendar? It's probably posted on their website. If it isn't, you can call their office and just ask them, what are the public events that Congresswoman so-and-so is doing? Bird dogging. Ask questions. You know, And it's not about, it, it can be at times with somebody who's been really recalcitrant. Uh, the sit-ins in, in offices of members has been, have been very effective in, in reaching people who are not so easy to reach. But it's also about having a real conversation. You know, particularly there's a lot of people who are liberal on a lot of issues and yet are not calling for a ceasefire, have not been willing to sign on to the ceasefire resolution and have not been willing to write their own letter. If they don't want to sign that one, fine, write your own. You know, they've not been willing to do that. So having a conversation to say, UNICEF says there's a child dying under Israeli bombs that we pay for and we send them every 10 minutes. How can you not want a ceasefire for that? What does that mean? And then they'll come back and say some version of, well, it's only going to help Hamas. And then you have an answer. The answer is, we don't know if it's going to help Hamas. Hopefully it will help everybody there, but we know it will help the children who won't be killed. They will be helped by a ceasefire. And that should be enough to overcome the fact that some bad guy somewhere might also be helped. That's that, you know, that's also going back to the moral part, but you're linking it to the politics of it as well. Thank you. So I, I understand that um, Jewish Voice for Peace has particularly been saying call every day. If you called yesterday, great. Call, call again. again today yeah. And call Absolutely. again tomorrow. You Absolutely. Think yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. It, because it's important that they know both numbers and levels of passion. How many children, you know, you can do the math, figure out how many, you know, there's what, six, that's six children every hour. You know, in that day, since I called you last, whatever it is, 29 children have been killed under bombs that we have paid for. I can't sleep at night knowing that. Why can you? You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways to play that, but absolutely call twice a day if you can. You know, and sometimes you'll get the, the answer line, the, you know, to leave a message, leave the message, don't hang up on it, leave a substantive message. If you get a person, it's usually interns that answer the phones, say to them, are you the same person that answered the phone yesterday? Did I talk to you yesterday? Because I'm calling every day because we know that, you know, tell them, let them feel your passion because they'll relay that probably not very clearly, not very well, but they will relay it one way or another. So let them hear that. It's absolutely right. It's absolutely right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and just, well, I'll tell folks more about this later, but we are going to be holding um, a Zoom call in slash letter to the editor writing event. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so I'll 
I'll be sure to, to remember to tell you all that at the end. Um, so we, I have many other questions. First, I, I would like to ask if you have, you know, you use some words tonight that were not always, uh, that sometimes people have big reactions to. Mm -hmm. um, and whether, however, you know, do you have ideas for how we can reach out and talk to people who think differently about this. Um, so, you know, I've, it's been heartbreaking to me to talk to some of my Jewish friends who don't feel they can talk to their families about this. And, you know, just the idea that... Right. Do you have any thoughts? I do. I've lost friends too. I've had in the past issues with parts of my extended family. I was lucky, my close family uh, didn't necessarily agree with me, but they were proud of what I did. Um, I choose my words carefully. I use language tonight that I wouldn't necessarily use if I were on a television program or if I was meeting in a Elks Hall or something like that. I'm meeting with peace action. And I make certain assumptions about people in peace action. Um, I try to use those words carefully and with definitions and with explanation of why I use them and why they've become normalized. You know, who who's written the reports that have documented Israeli apartheid? It matters that it includes Israeli human rights organizations and not only international ones. So I always say those too. I don't mention only Amnesty and Human Rights Watch or only the UN. I also mention Yeshdin and, and uh, B'Tselem. But I also think for us, it's important not to shy away from those very harsh realities. It doesn't mean that we use that language all the time. And there's no... It, it, it's not something that, from my vantage point, it's not something that any of us should feel like if we don't use that language that somehow we're betraying the cause. The cause is how do we get support for a ceasefire? What's going to work? We, I got a note from a close friend who's one of the leaders of, of um, civil society organizations inside Palestine in the West Bank at the moment. And he said, look, I can't even, I can't sign on to this myself, but you've got to know that for all these, you know, for all the people who think this is the moment to be, you know, that this is the moment we've been waiting for, we can finally start talking about uh, uh, settler colonialism and anti-imperialism and that these are the things that are top of our agenda right now. Tell them, no, they need to focus on a ceasefire, that that's what we need. That's what we need. And that means softer language because we're trying to reach much more broadly than we usually do. We don't usually try to win over members of the city council or something like that. They don't have any power. Why should we bother? Well, we should bother because they have influence. When they write a letter to the editor, it's more likely to get published and it's more likely to get read and it's more likely to get believed. So that matters. So how do we reach a member of the city council? Probably not by talking about Israeli apartheid. I'm thinking maybe there's a few, but probably not. So you don't talk about it. That's fine. That's good. That means you're being strategic. Language is a strategic weapon. So don't feel like you have to use all of the most provocative language. You want to use language that can reach people. Sometimes being provocative does that. Sometimes it doesn't. And you'll know who you're talking to, if it's your neighbors, your friends, your family, what they can hear, what's going to be too painful, and they just turn, tune it out. That's no victory, because you, you were tough and said it, that, and then you lose them. That's no victory. The victory is when you say, oh my God, there's a child dying every 10 minutes. How can we as human beings allow that to go on and say we don't support a ceasefire because there might be some other implication of it? That's just crazy. You know, you use that kind of language because that reaches people. And it's just as true. It's just as real as using the language of apartheid. Thank you. That's very helpful. So being right 
might not be as important as moving this along. You want to be right. You don't want to be wrong, but you don't have to use all the most provocative language to be right. You know, it's, it's right that there's a child dying every 10 minutes. That's a horrific reality. How you talk about it depends on who you're talking to. Great. Um, I'd like to ask this one from Donna. What is the administration's calculation for what the US will gain from these policies? Can you speak about why there is this illusion of being helpful with this sort of support of Israel? And I'd add that I think many of us see this as really dangerous that both Israelis and Jewish people around the world are likely to suffer more from this kind of behavior. So why are we yeah. as friends doing this? That's absolutely true. Um, Anti-Semitism is on the rise and that's very real. And it's the real and dangerous kind of anti-Semitism that's on the rise, that the kind that kills people like we saw in Pittsburgh. What's also on the rise is the claims, the false claims of false charges of anti-Semitism that claim that any criticism of Israel is inherently anti-Semitic. And aside from that, having the impact of undermining the work for Palestinian rights, and in this case, Palestinian lives, it also makes it much harder to fight against the real anti-Semitism. So there's a link between the two. You know, when you have all your energy focused on these false claims, the real claims of anti-Semitism sort of slip by and nobody's really talking too much about them, about the, the anti-Semitic violence that comes out of white supremacy. That's the origins of, of, white, of, of anti-Semitism in this country. My good boy, go on the couch. Um, so in this, in this context, you know, I think that that's, um, that's a very strong reality. Why the administration is taking this position, I don't think is any different. And I think when this began, they just took it as a matter of faith that we stand with Israel. We always stand with Israel. Everybody in Washington stands with Israel, the White House, the Congress. This is the starting point. This is the default position. And when Israel has been attacked, of course, we're going to stand with Israel. There's a way in which that was logical on October 7th. The, the horror of that attack was profound. It was, it was something that Israel and Israelis had not experienced since at least 1973 from that war, and for many of them, never had. And in that way, it did have parallels with 9-11 in terms of you know, there was no one alive in the United States who was a who had been born and raised in the United States who had experienced an attack like that on our soil, on our people. So that was it was shocking as well as frightening and horrifying and all those things. It was just nobody had ever experienced that before. And so it set the stage for this massive outpouring of support for a war against a country that had nothing to do with it. Right. So, you know, it's not surprising that there was this, yeah, this is your 9-11 and try not to make all the mistakes we did, but what you're doing is largely right. Just try to do it a little nicer. That's, that's the message. That was the message. Why it was, it's because it's both a political and a strategic reality. Israel is a very important strategic partner of the US on a military level. The, the reliance on, mil, on, on uh, military surveillance the, the surveillance war stuff that Israel creates, much of which have, has been created in tandem with the United States, all of that make it a very strategic uh, ally. But it also is a hugely important political point. You know, and Biden is somebody who also, and Blinken as well, they both, <clears throat> they both define themselves as Zionists, which isn't something that most U.S. politicians do, uh, particularly those that aren't Jewish. Blinken, of course, is Jewish and Biden is not. Biden has, you know, he talks about being a Zionist. You don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist. And the bear hugs with, with Netanyahu, his close relations with Israeli leaders for over 50 years. Um, it's his instinct 
to move in that direction. And it's politically always been good for him. The fact that this time around, it's really not. It's really not good for him. And he's seeing it in the polls specifically around uh, Arab American voters. But if they start looking at young voters, they're getting the same thing. Young voters are saying, I'm not going to vote for this guy. How could I? When he has endorsed genocide. It's shocking. And I don't think they've quite come to terms yet with that reality uh, in how they're going to ultimately make their calculations about where it plays out on the voting side, what it means for any of them individually. They're also dealing with major opposition in the State Department in particular. There's been this public letter that's come out, you know, about the guy who resigned from the State Department after 11 years working in what he called, he had an interesting term for it, uh, morally challenging positions that he was in. He was he was responsible for, for sending weapons around the world. Let's be clear, including a lot that were used for war crimes. So yeah, it was kind of a challenge. And, you know, me, I sort of wanted to ask him why it took him 11 years, but okay, he did it and that's good. And that's important. There's others that are, there's a letter that's been circulating internally that was leaked by Politico. And there's people apparently in the White House, there's people among congressional staffers. We're hearing all these rumors of people getting whispered notes. I can't stand this anymore. I don't know what I, what I should do. Should I quit? Should I, you know? So there's opposition bubbling up from within the administration. And it's coming particularly from young people. And, they, and that means it's people that are sort of lower down on the hierarchies of power, but they're also people who they know are needed to figure out how to reach young voters when election time comes around. So they can't afford to be cavalier about a bunch of these young people walking out, particularly if there were to be, for example, a walkout. What a concept. You know, a one-day strike. Maybe a few people collectively will decide to quit. I don't know, but any of that could happen and the impact could be quite powerful. So they're having to deal with that. Um, Blinken has been, I think, very smart in saying both publicly and probably privately that he is absolutely committed to, ha to having a State Department that is open to all, all positions and all perspectives. And he appreciates people using the internal methods to raise their criticisms and they are taken seriously and on and on and on. But as long as that keeps happening and people don't see any results, that level of, of opposition and frustration is certainly going to rise. Okay. Um, we have quite a few more questions. And just in case, especially if you were late joining us tonight, Phyllis did agree to stay a little bit later than our usual end time. That is why we are still going. And um, I think the next one I'd like to ask, so this is within the, it sort of continues the same question. Barbara's wondering what the consequences would be for not giving the $14 billion, especially would they, would this, okay, would they be afraid to deny those funds because they won't get voted in because of the loss of the Jewish vote? You know, it's really funny. I don't think they actually think that this 14 billion is anything that voters particularly wanted. It's tricky now that they kind of promised it. And if they now withhold it, there might be some vacillation. And certainly there are pro-Israeli organizations, APAC and other lobby organizations, which are not only Jewish. The, the um, Christian Zionist movement, Christian uh, uh, evangelicals, are far more powerful, particularly in the in the uh, uh, Republican Party, than the Jewish lobbies are. There still is money that is often used for not so much money to like bribe, you know, members, con candidates for for Congress or something, and say, if you vote this way, we'll give you money. It's more likely to come in the form of, if you don't, we will provide a lot of money to an opponent that may not even exist yet. You know, it's that sort of. Uh, methodology. But I think that this isn't a Jewish thing. This is, you know, this is a Republican thing. Support for Israel has become a thoroughly partisan issue. So it's almost reversed now. The, the numbers, if you look at, I don't remember them all, but it's 
it's in the area of about 65% of Republicans uh, are strong, define themselves as strong supporters of Israel and something like 30% of Democrats say they're strong supporters of Israel. There's a flip if you ask about supporting Palestinians. It's it's pretty astonishing. So that has all happened in the last several years. And where there's an even bigger gap is, is as much, or as much at least, I don't know, bigger, but at least as big as the divide between Republicans and Democrats is among Democrats in the divide between the electeds and the base of the party. That's where you're seeing this huge shift. That's where you're seeing you know, 25% of Democrats saying that they believe Israel is an apartheid state. Well, you're not seeing 25% of elected Democrats saying Israel is an apartheid state. You're seeing one Democrat say that Israel is an apartheid state. So, you know, it's that's where there's a, a huge gap that they are now facing because the election is less than a year away. It's, well, just about a year. So that's becoming a very big um, problem. I don't think anybody is worried about if they take away that uh, that that 14 billion. If you want some good answers to the question, well, what else could the 14 billion be used for? My colleagues at IPS that run the the uh, National Priorities Project have just posted on their wonderful website a new batch of trade-offs of what the 14 billion could cover in terms of how many kids could get Head Start placement, um, how many school teachers could be hired how many uh, veterans could get health care, how many houses could get um, uh, uh, retrofitted for green heat. There's a bunch of different ones. Take your pick and you can mix and match how many of each you know you want. Um, so that's always a good, it's a good thing to have in mind when you talk to your members of Congress. You want to talk about keeping people safe? Here's what keeps people safe. Jobs and health care and education. So don't tell us that there's no money for those things when you want to give away $106 billion for military stuff, $14 billion to Israel, $61 billion to Ukraine. The rest of it is divided between Taiwan and militarizing the southern border. This is not what makes us more safe, but it takes a, more than $100 billion away from our federal budget. So make them do the math. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to hear there's an update um, for the priorities project. All right. Yeah. I think next I'm going to ask you Sarah's question. Can you talk about the increased settler attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank? That is yes. Bad. Yes. A very important question. While the world's attention has been focused so in, in a way that's been so needed on Gaza, conditions in the West Bank have deteriorated massively. And that primarily is taking the form of, of the collaboration between extremist settlers who are under the complete protection of this extremist government in Israel uh, and soldiers, because they operate under the protection of the soldiers, sometimes with the soldiers' actual participation, sometimes with them standing back and just guarding them to make sure that no Palestinian dares to fight back, dares to, to resist. But there has been over a hundred, over a thousand, I think it was a thousand seven hundred, maybe I can't remember the exact number. Somewhere over a thousand uh, Palestinians who have been arrested this week in the West Bank and are being held, almost all of them, for under administrative detention, under which you you, you probably know Israeli have a, a system of preventive detention where they don't have to provide uh, to either the lawyer or to the it's not even really a defendant because they're not charged with anything. There's no actual evidence that can be rebutted or refuted. They're not convicted of anything because they're not charged with anything. They're simply sent to prison for six months. And that can be repeated over and over again. So that there are people who have now been in Israeli military prison for years on one after another six month uh, term of administrative detention. 12 of those people are children. There's 160 kids in Israel's military prisons. I don't know if there's been any new any kids arrested this week. Actually, one former kid who you all may have seen as a kid, uh, Ahed Tamimi, that extraordinary young girl that at age 16, in a confrontation with a soldier who had just beaten up her cousin and arrested her father, she slapped him. 
she slapped this giant, tall, big soldier wearing a flat jacket and the whole thing, a little slender little girl of 16 years. And she was arrested and became a, a great sort of hero of, of Palestinians. She was just arrested today, as a matter of fact, at age 22, the ripe old age, um, under administrative detention. She's not being charged with anything yet. Maybe she will, maybe she won't. Uh, she was sentenced to eight months in prison when she was 16. Um, and this is all military prisons where these kids serve their time. Um, so all of that is going on, as well as straight up attacks. More olive trees are being uprooted. Homes are being destroyed, just bulldozed to the ground. Uh, several more uh, Bedouin villages have been uh, destroyed. Their tents burned. Um so there's been just huge levels of violence. Uh, 130, I think, some 130 something numbers of Palestinians have been killed in, in the West Bank in these three and a half weeks since October 7th. So the escalation is very strong in, in the West Bank as well. Um, there's a great deal of, of, uh, uh, of violence underway and, there, and the government is doing nothing to, to rein it in. Quite the contrary, they're actually endorsing it, supporting it, and participating in it. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more. I think what I'd like to ask you here, and I'm sorry, folks, we're not going to get to everything. Um, do know we'll keep having programs. There's other ones that we'll let you know about um, where you can continue to learn about about what's happening. Um, but I'd like to ask a few questions around around the ceasefire. I'm, I'm going to see about um, essentially what does a solution look like? So if we get the ceasefire, what exactly does that mean? Is that how long can that last? I think you pretty much said we don't know. Um, but what you know, is there a next step for trying to deal with the root causes and trying to find a deeper solution? Uh, solution. Sorry, yeah, there, there is, but the reality is, we don't know what's going to happen in Gaza. There needs to be a ceasefire that stops it. Just stop permanently. That's the call. Now, will it last forever? Probably not, given history. But that's what we need: is a permanent ceasefire. Just stop on all sides. I mean, this is it's it's mainly the Israeli military assault that is killing people. But Hamas and others are sending these ridiculous rockets out of Gaza into Israel. Luckily, they're not hitting anything because you can't really aim them. And they've been lucky that nobody's been killed, nobody's been hurt. But they should stop anyway. There's still a violation because you can't target them against military targets. Palestinians living under occupation do have the right to use armed force against a military occupation, but they don't have the right to use it against civilians. So if you can't target a military target, it's illegal. But the real issue is, is there going to be a ceasefire? If there is, the question of what is going to remain of Gaza remains a very unclear notion. Virtually all of Northern Gaza has been destroyed now. Is it going to be rebuilt? It was a crowded, fetid place that no one wanted to live in. This wasn't where these people were from. They were from what is now Southern Israel. They were refugees in Gaza. Will they want to rebuild refugee camps to live in? I don't know. I don't know. The level of trauma is going to be so severe. I mean, the last major assault on Gaza, which was the one in 2014, far, far worse than the ones in, that came after in 2018 and 2021, it went on for 50 days and it ended up with 2,200 Palestinians being killed. The vast majority of them, like this time, civilians. The trauma was enormous and much of it never was rebuilt. The Brits and the Europeans came in and said, well, we'll rebuild this school or we'll rebuild this water treatment plant, you know, here and there. But there was no rebuilding of the whole uh, of the whole area, of the whole Gaza Strip, the whole city of Gaza. This time, there's almost nothing left. It's rubble. It's a, it's a strip of rubble. 
And even in the South, which was supposed to be the safe zone, there's nothing safe about it. And they're continuing to bomb it. So what will be left by the time a ceasefire takes hold? I don't think we know. What the U.S. is trying to pressure the European, the Egyptians to do is to allow virtually the entire population of Gaza through the fence into Egypt, but not into Egypt, just into what the Egyptians say, if they allow in people, which they don't want to do. But if, if the U.S. gives them enough money and enough weapons, they will. They will, uh, they will put people in a sealed off refugee camp with tents. They will not be allowed to leave that. They will not be allowed to go into the rest of Egypt. They will certainly not be allowed to go to Cairo. They will not have any more rights than they did in Gaza. They will just be on the other side of the fence and they will be under Egyptian rather than Israeli control. They will not be free. That's the best solution that the U.S. so far has come up with. So there's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do. Okay, and I am going to be, I'm going to help us wrap up here. Um, again, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but that was inevitable no matter how many, how long we spent here. Um, and I want to respect Phyllis's, you know, time. We don't want to keep her too long. So I'm going to give you a little information here. I put some things in the chat. Um, we including links so you can continue to read phyllis writes prolifically on this wonderful brilliant stuff so you can follow her and keep learning okay. that way there's also um i put a link to jewish voice for peace that's doing some really really inspiring work right now action a lot of action um also peace action new hampshire peace action you can go to nhpeaceaction.org and look us up on Facebook also to learn more about what we're working on and what programming we have coming up. It, it's not as updated as, as it could be. We don't have a director at the moment. We're supposed to be searching for a director, but we're, our attention is in a bunch of places. But let me tell you a few things we do have. On Thursday, November 16th at 7 p.m. on Zoom, we'll have a New Hampshire Peace Action Axe for a ceasefire now in Gaza. We'll make calls to our representatives and get help drafting letters to the editor. Steve Varnum, who is a journalist for 25 years and many of us know, will come and share his expertise on how to write effective letters. Um, our next online peace and justice conversation is Monday, November 20th, 7 p.m. It's featuring Greg Coleridge from Move to Amend, who's going to explore the link between U.S. militarism and corporations and corporate personhood. Um, Monday, December 4th at 7 p.m. on Zoom, we're welcoming former diplomat and Colonel Anne Wright to talk about how wars end, including what conditions lead to ceasefires and how we can help bring those about. This series is free and open to everyone. That said, it means a lot to us when you do donate. And um, I think Doreen put that in the chat, otherwise I will do it again, just in case. Um, and yeah, we, we thank you all for coming we, and caring about this and for your calls and letters and, you know, work to, to change the situation. And again, we just want to give our heartfelt thanks to Phyllis, who not only came here today, but has come to other events and has been working tirelessly, it seems to us, on this, this issue and many others really important to us for decades. And we just, we deeply appreciate you, Phyllis. Thank you for everything you do and who you are. Thank you all very much. Um, yeah, I, it just occurred to me, I had a copy on my desk because I was getting a quote before. If people are interested, this little primer, it's the seventh edition of it, um, might be useful. It's it's a bunch of FAQs on the history, the current situation. It's a little bit out of date because this most recent edition came out just before COVID hits. So I wasn't on the road, so we didn't sell most of them. So it's it's from uh, 2019, 2018-19. Um, so it's a little bit out of date, but if you want to use it, it can be useful for some of the background stuff. Can you say the say aloud the, the title just to make sure? Sure. I can even put it in the chat. 
Um, it's called Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a Primer. Um, here, Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a Primer. And it's from interlinkbooks.com or Interlink Books in their Practically Neighbors of Yours in Northampton, Mass. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, all right. Excellent resource. And yeah, everyone stay tuned with us, with other groups you've heard about tonight, and we will um, we will be keeping on this incredibly important moment um, to really speak up and use our, our voices and our actions and everything we have to make a difference. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Thank you.